Okay, if you, uh, if you take your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name's uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute, and on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event today. I was telling Tom earlier, or I think last night I texted him, I said, your talk just got a lot more interesting over here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're pleased to have with us, this is actually our, our latest event on a series of events we're doing on the Trump administration. We'll have several more upcoming. I'll be announcing the dates on those in the next uh, week or so. Uh, we'll have one on, the, on Trump and the Supreme Court. We're also going to have Washington's Attorney General coming to town oh, nice. to talk about the litigation. Uh, and uh, see, we've got a couple others, but we'll be announcing those next week or so. We have those dates now done. Today, however, we have uh, with us Tom Preston. And Tom is a C.O. Johnson Distinguished Professor of Political Science in the School of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs here at WSU. Tom's research is focused on national security policy, foreign affairs, and political psychology. He is also a faculty research associate at the Moynihan Institute at the, at the uh, uh, at, uh, Institute of Global Affairs at Syracuse University, and also at the National Center for Crisis Management Research and Training, which is a part of the Swedish National Defense College in Stockholm. Tom received his PhD from the Ohio State University. He is the author of numerous journal articles and, and three books. His most recent book is entitled Pandora's Trap, Presidential Decision Making and Blame Avoidance in Vietnam and Iraq, which was published by Roman and Littlefield. Join me now in welcoming Tom Preston. Thanks for coming out. I, I, I can't think of a topic more fitting for Valentine's Day. Really. <laughs> <laughs> here and really, uh, you know, this is a really romantic topic. Um, I'm a profiler. I do political psychology, and one of the, the things that I do is uh, leadership profiles. And so what I'm going to be doing today is basically giving you a profile, a psychological profile of Donald Trump. Uh, and the effects that that is going to have on his likely style of leadership, how he's going to use information, advice, uh, etc. Um, and, you know, the reality is it's really important with presidents what their personalities are like because leadership style sets the rules of the game. It determines what roles advisors are going to be allowed to play. It's going to affect how they use intelligence, how they structure things. Uh, in many respects, it's an enabler of power. It's, it's, it's something that either is going to help a president be effective and be uh, able to, to run their shop well, or it's going to be something that's going to work against their ability to do so. Uh, now, I'm going to be talking about sort of individual characteristics. Uh, my colleague Margaret Herman and I uh, have done psychological profiling of foreign leaders, uh, both in academia and for the government. And uh, what I'm going to give you the uh, profile results are from is from a leadership trait analysis uh, that Peg did over at Syracuse and we're going to be uh, trying to put into publication here soon. And it's basically a content analysis that looks at individual speeches and Q&As and interviews, any material like that that codes for certain types of individual characteristics, self-confidence, need for power, distrust, things of that nature. Uh, and we have coded already over 600 world leaders. And so when I talk about Trump being high or low or something like that, I'm talking relative to a very large uh, population of world leaders. Also, a lot of my work in several of my books has developed a leadership style framework which really connects these characteristics to particular types of styles and ways that presidents use their, their, their advisory system. Now, two big dimensions that I focus on uh, really are the leader's need for control and their general sensitivity to context. And, you know, you probably know, I mean, you, you all know people like this that have high needs for control. You, you know, think about people in your own lives. There are some people who just have to have their hands on everything. They cannot let anybody else do it. They just can't delegate. Whereas, you know, other people are very happy to just, you know, delegate things away. It's kind of a spectrum. So people vary a great deal on how much control and involvement they need uh, when making decisions. Also, you know, when I talk about general sensitivity to context and need for information, think again about people that you know. I mean, you probably know people who are very content making decisions based on very little information. They just, they just move along very fast, whereas other people, 
you know, sometimes need so much information that they almost become paralytic because they just need more and more. They, they just, oh, well, I just need a little bit more uh, to make a decision. Now, since I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions, just throwing up, you know, my, my model, you know, when you think about how much control we need, Donald Trump falls more in this magistrate category in my topology. Uh, where you expect decision making in a centralized inner circle, uh, president's need for con direct control over decisions, uh, but, but kind of delegating it in, in lower levels, uh, sets general guidelines but delegates formulation, implementation, uh, and also in terms of uh, sensitivity to information, uh, Trump would fall more into this maverick category with low complexity and not a lot of prior experience, and I'll talk about that here in a second. The things that our profile would talk about expecting from Trump is that he would need low needs for information and advice, be largely insensitive to external constraints on policy. He would select advisors based on loyalty and ideological fit over expertise and competence. Decisions would be driven more by idiosyncratic policy views, ideology and principles, although it's hard to know what Trump's ideology is. And a heavy use of simplistic analogies and stereotypes to frame the decision environment. So overall, what is this Trump uh, profile? Basically, uh, you know, let's kind of run down some of the characteristics, and then I'll talk about each of them uh, in turn and what they what they mean. He has low, I mean, basically no prior policy experience, and this is kind of unique. Uh, we've never had a president like this because most presidents have had some governmental experience or some military experience. Uh, Trump has had none of them. So he actually has, you know, basically zero prior policy experience or expertise in foreign or domestic policy. Uh, he has a high need for control. Uh, he has a, and, and how we break this down, he has a high internal locus of control. Uh, if you have an internal locus of control, it means that you have a high belief in your own ability to control events. That you control what happens rather than the environment. Uh, he also has moderate to high needs for power. Uh, so kind of have a high need for control, You're probably going to want to have his hands on things. Uh, low conceptual complexity, uh, low self-confidence, uh, extremely high distrust of others. And what's interesting about this, Trump, we've never seen a score like this. He is three standard deviations higher than the average score for world leaders on distrust. Uh, so Andy has a high need for affiliation, a very low task orientation. So there's the diagnosis. What does that mean? Well, in a practical sense, what does that mean when we start talking about how Trump uh, will conduct policy or engage with advisors, etc.? Let's cover the first one first. What, what happens when you have low prior policy experience or expertise or, or none? Um, well, basically what usually with presidents their leadership styles are not the same depending on foreign or domestic. I mean, they, they kind of differ just because some presidents have more background or expertise in a foreign or a domestic area. Um, up until this point among modern presidents, only W. Bush had come across as having a style similar in domestic and foreign because he really didn't have expertise in either of those either. Trump is a little different because he has zero experience in these things. But it also means that his leadership style is basically going to be the same whether we're looking at foreign or domestic policy. Um, you know, when, when uh, Peg and I will you know, talk in government uh, settings, uh, you know, if we're talking about foreign leaders, it's always easier to say, well, you know, leaders like this, like Trump, are much more consistent. They're a lot easier to predict than the ones who are, are a little more engaged and paying attention to uh, incoming information because they tend to be fairly consistent. Well, his style will be consistent. Trump would be expected to be highly dependent upon expert advisors uh, to flesh out the details of policy and, and, and for its implementation. And, and that makes sense because if you think about it, I mean, if you don't have any personal background or knowledge about something, what do you have to do? You have to rely on people who, who have some background. And so generally that's the pattern that you would see. The problem here for Trump, and I think you see it, and we'll talk about some of the people that he's appointed around him, is that that lack of expertise and knowledge on his part makes it very difficult for him to, to set up his, his, his inner circles and his advisory system with experienced people. Uh, and what, what you often see in this sort of thing is that you don't end up with a true inner circle of experts to help a president like this who really needs help. 
Uh, but what you have is what I term pseudo-experts. And a pseudo-expert is only somebody who is believed to be an expert by the leader or by the president. And so it doesn't really matter whether you or I would sort of, you know, say, well, that person doesn't really have any background. What, what does Ben Carson know about that? It doesn't really matter. If Trump thinks he's an expert, he's going to treat him as an expert. And so that ends up being who, who he's going to delegate things to, which, you know, and you just kind of wonder how far down the delegation road do you have to go to hit an expert at a certain point. Um, and, and, you know, having a lot of pseudo-experts really compromises the quality of policy. I mean, just as an example, I mean, here you have, you know, we just have the sort of the embarrassment over the Yemen raid uh, and the immigration rollout. Uh, the Yemen raid, I mean, that was decided with Stephen Bannon, who had been the editor of Breitbart, which isn't a news source, and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, over dinner. It was not staffed out. It was not sent out for review. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I'm sorry, this is not George Marshall, Brent Scowcroft, and Henry Kissinger around the president. You know, it's obvious that you're not going to get the same sort of quality or caliber of advice and feedback as you would if, if you had real experts. And so what we would expect from this sort of thing would be a pattern of poorly designed and implemented policies, a tendency for the administration to be caught by surprise, by blowback resulting from these policies hitting the real world, uh, and frequent policy fiascos and a lot of bureaucratic fighting across Washington. Here we're already seeing it, about two weeks in, three weeks in, we're already seeing all of those things. Um, now, you know, and, and like with the immigration thing, it's just, it's just an example. Here you have, I mean, colleagues of mine who were in DHS basically were saying this is, you know, when this first hit, it was just buzzing that not even the senior most people at DHS, Department of Homeland Security, sorry knew that this order was coming. I mean, all this just was launched on without any sort of consultation. There's just a lack of staffing. Uh, so again, uh, this is going to end up being problematic for the administration. Sets you, tees you up for problems. The high need for control. Um, you know, Trump has that high internal focus of control, believes that he can determine outcomes more than the external environment. You hear a lot of that talk, you know, I'm the, I, I'll be able to negotiate. You'll, you'll get tired of winning so much. I'm already tired. Well, when you're, you're already tired. You're bigly tired. Are you bigly tired? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, you, you've got this sort of setup. And that high need for control suggests that Trump is going to directly challenge constraints in the environment due to that belief that he can control his own destiny. Uh, but the problem is, that lack of governing experience and policy knowledge, coupled with a very insular advisory system, is likely to lead to a lot of serious miscalculations and policy fiascos because it's going to be very easy for Trump to overestimate his ability to control events uh, when maybe it isn't merited. Uh, leaders like this that have a high need for control also tend to micromanage a lot of times on select issues that they have strong uh, views about. And they become very frustrated and pushy when they appear to lose control. And they frequently tend to lash out at opponents. Does that sound like anybody? <laughs> uh, so uh, very much a Machiavellian ends just by the mean sort of uh, attitude. Uh, some other aspects of that high need for control would be that policy formulation and decision making in the Trump administration would be expected to be tightly centralized within a close White House inner circle. Uh, because trust is such an important factor here for Trump. Trump would be expected to have a preference for direct control over final decisions, but a limited need for personal involvement throughout the policy uh, process, because he just doesn't have the background. So in other words, he's going to set the general guidelines, but delegate the formulation and implementation to subordinates. And their views are also going to strongly influence his views. Um, now, this matters a great deal. Because, I mean, if we were looking at a foreign leader and, and policymakers were saying, who should we look at to determine what's, what policies are going to be happening, we would always say, well, you'd focus on the people around that leader because their views will become his views. You know. uh, well, here, you, here you've got this. In this case, who inhabits Trump's closest inner circle of advisors is going to matter enormously in terms of policymaking. Uh, because that loyal inner circle advisors, or you know, whoever has Trump's ear the most is going to be the most influential. Uh, and it's certainly a reason to be even more concerned about the proximity of advisors like Bannon, 
uh, to Trump, or Stephen Miller, uh, people who have no background but are just ideologues. Uh, and they've both already been shown to be very influential on in policy. Low conceptual complexity. Now, what, what, what does that mean? When I talk about complexity, um, people always mistake that for meaning IQ, and that is not what complexity is. Complexity is just the degree to which you differentiate your environment. Let me give you a practical example. Think about people you know. You probably know people who you know, see everything in the world in very black and white terms, very absolute terms. See the right or wrong, true or false, or with us or against us, that sort of thing. And then you probably also know people who see the shades of gray. Well, it could be this, it could be that. There's lots of possibilities. So it's just a way of seeing the world, uh, how much you differentiate. In some ways, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's almost whether you have your antennae up and you're gathering information and you're kind of one or whether you have your antennae down. Uh, maybe a good way to explain it. Now, Trump does not see shades of gray. Trump is very, very black and white, very absolute, very low complexity. And there's a lot of consequences of that low complexity. And this is a very powerful measure that we found in looking at other leaders uh, and past presidents. Leaders with this sort of low complexity tend to have very closed information advisory systems. In other words, they only seek advice from like-minded advisors and they only gather information that supports their pre-existing views. They are largely <laughs> insensitive to external constraints on policy making. They kind of challenge them primarily because the antennae are down. They're not monitoring to see, oh, is that a pothole ahead? They, don't, they just drive full speed. Uh, they don't pay attention to that. Advisors are selected based on loyalty and ideological fit over competence and expertise. And dissent is seen as disloyalty. Okay, for these sorts of leaders. And certainly many of, many of these cabinet picks so far certainly show that focus of loyalty over expertise. I mean, you know, Ben Carson at HUD, Rick Perry at Energy, DeVos <laughs> at Education, Pompeo at CIA, Pruitt at EPA. And these are not competent experts in any of these areas. They're just loyal, loyal followers. Okay, so you see this pattern um, developing here with Trump. Um, such leaders also do not value different perspectives or viewpoints, and they tend to lash out at advice or information that challenges their existing views or policy. So, and you know, we have lots of examples three weeks in of this, obviously. You know, Trump's attacks on the media, uh, on the judiciary, on anyone that challenges his facts or versions of the events. He has, he's just very incredibly hyper-defensive in terms of pers personally pr protecting this personal reality bubble. Uh, you know, when the intelligence community came out with the evidence about the Russian hacking and was pushing that, Trump's response was to reor you know, threaten to reorganize CIA and to reduce their budget and lower their workforce. Uh, you know, the National Security Council was reorganized and the Director of National Intelligence and the Joint Chief, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff guy was removed and Bannon was put on. Apparently Trump didn't realize what he was signing. Uh, so here, you know, you have, you know, some of these you know, this sort of lashing out, you know, tweeting attacks on everybody, hanging up on the Australian Prime Minister, not liking Alec Baldwin. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you see quite a bit of that. Um, low complexity leaders also tend to exhibit rapid, impulsive decision making styles based on little or no information search. So you have this rapid fire decision uh, that result in immense challenges for maintaining policy consistency or utilizing staffs effectively. And it results in a lot of self-inflicted wounds from shooting at the hip and really hitting the hip. Uh, I mean, Truman, a good example, Harry Truman was low complexity. And Truman, Truman would, you know, people would come into Truman, I, I had a number of people who worked for Harry Truman, and they would say, you know, you could walk into Harry Truman's office and come out with 15 decisions in five minutes. Make this fast for anybody. The problem is, you could then go into President Truman's office and get 15 more decisions, some of them contradicting <coughs> the ones he just gave. They weren't staffed out. And it was chaotic at the beginning of the Truman administration until somebody put into place some controls. You weren't allowed to go just talk to the President. We have to staff this stuff out. Well, you see the same, same problem with Trump. Trump also tends to agree with the last person who saw him. He makes fast decisions. How many executive orders in two weeks? 24 now? You know, almost like a TV show. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's no staffing. There's no staffing for this stuff. 
uh, improvise phone calls with other world leaders. I mean, I'm sorry. Any credible you know, people come State Department, if you're going to call the Australian Prime Minister or you're going to call Putin, they would have already briefed you on what the nature of the START Treaty was. They would have told you, yeah, Mr. President, we have this agreement on taking refugees. It's obvious nobody's staff, staffing the president. He's just winging the improv in his calls. I can imagine the State Department people just want to crawl into a fetal position. You know, when they look at the news in the morning, like, well, what fire do we have to put out today? Uh, so this is a problem, and until that is dealt with, you're just going to see this continual pattern of chaos without adequate staffing. Um, and then I t antenna down that limited search for information. I mean, really contrast, you know, you think about other types of presidents. I mean, John Kennedy was high complexity. And if we were in a meeting and you were all agreeing with Jack Kennedy, if I was Jack Kennedy, that would make me really uncomfortable. I mean, I want, you know, I mean, okay, even during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when his initial, you know, favorite solution was maybe an airstrike, when most of the advisors were saying airstrike, it made Kennedy uncomfortable. And even during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he red teamed and got some people to argue for a blockade. Trump would never do this. I mean, this is, it makes a big difference in terms of how presidents use information when you have that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, Trump is very, very big, big, big picture uh, and, and gets very bored on the focus on, on some details a lot of the time. He doesn't value the presidential daily briefs. Uh, from the intelligence community. He doesn't read much at all, apparently doesn't read books. He relies on social media and television, mostly Fox News, for his information, to help us all. Uh, and, and only wants the most superficial presentation of information from staff. I mean, staff are already talking about that Trump wants one-page reports with lots of maps, because he likes maps. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, you know, the, the, when you have a, a, a leader with no experience or background, surrounded by experts who are not really that expert, you couple that with not taking advantage of the intelligence or the information that's, that tries to get in, you can see the problem. Um, and, you know, and, they, and, and low complexity leaders, if you, if you already think things are right or wrong, true or false, whatever, that's what leads to this, I don't need to know this other information. I already know what's right. I already know how it should be. That's why Trump, when they ask him, why aren't you taking the CIA briefings? Oh, well, I'm, I'm smart. I don't need them because I'm smart. Uh, as a result, one of the consequences of this and what we'll see uh, in, in the years ahead is that such leaders do not learn fast. Uh, they don't get a lot of feedback, adequate feedback from situations. They have difficulty recognizing changing environments. They have a low adaptability when they need to change or alter tack on a policy. Think about Johnson in Vietnam or W. Bush in Iraq, both low complexity leaders that did not necessarily have their antennae up. They looked for certain types of information that was supportive of both policies. It is very hard for them to shift gears, and I think you'll see the same thing with Trump. Also, you tend to see with this sort of leader very heavy use of simplistic, poor quality analogies to understand problems. A lot of times, policymakers will often use analogies, well, this will be like Vietnam, or this will be like Munich, or whatever, to understand the nature of a problem that they're facing, or understand the options that they have to deal with. It helps them to frame things. Well, you know, what you tend to see with this sort of leader is very, very simplistic, sort of poorly designed analogies. Uh, that don't fit the situation very. Lots of stereotypes, bad hombres uh, among yeah. them. Uh, and low self-monitoring. Uh, self-monitoring is do you actually, uh, do you try, to, do you try to, 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 to fit in with the situation? Are you sensitive to the situation you're in when you're interacting with others, or are you just, you're just you? Uh, well, Trump is very low self-monitoring. He, uh, he doesn't really uh, alter what he says depending on what audience he's, you know, he'll, and, and he doesn't seem to care. I mean, he'll mock disabled reporters in front of reporters. He'll state clear falsehoods to audiences that he knows. I mean, he, he goes to Langley and tells a whole bunch of intelligence analysts how big his inaugural crowd was. Yeah, these people don't know how to do intelligence at all. <laughs> they don't know how to look at data or their televisions. Uh, you know, so, you know, it, it's that constant lying in front of the media. Uh, and, and audiences demonstrates hardly any self-monitoring at all. So basically, the bottom line, Trump is going to be Trump regardless of the situation or audience, and that's what we would expect uh, in this pattern. Uh, finally, uh, you know, we basically see Trump, these sorts of leaders, low-complexity leaders, tend to be 
Um, they, they, they tend to appoint advisors that are like themselves. We call it the doppelganger effect. Um, and the problem for Trump is that, that he's not just appointing people that have a, just sort of one ideological view. He's appointing people that are lacking experience in the same way he is too. Uh, so his doppelgangers are, that's why you see all these Wall Street CEOs in the administration. You see all these business people. I mean, it's almost, you know, not having government experience is almost seen as, as a positive. Other than being a military officer, that's the only other thing that he will appoint, it seems. Uh, so now what's the problem with that? If you appoint a whole bunch of inexperienced people around you and you base it on loyalty rather than competence, you may get away with it. You would never know who Brown was at, at FEMA. You wouldn't have ever heard of Brown's name at FEMA if Hurricane Katrina hadn't hit it. Okay? W. Bush appointed based on loyalty over competence, too. And Brown was head of FEMA uh, that was in charge of handling the Katrina response. His only expertise, his background was running an equestrian horse foundation mm -hmm. and donating a lot of money to W. Bush. Okay? So the point I'm making here is if you appoint advisors that lack this expertise, you might get away with it, but if some crisis happens, it's going to expose that underbelly of inexperience, and it's going to make it more difficult for you to handle effectively some of these crises. Um, and, you know, if you have this sort of uh, difficulty permeating or, or getting, you know, alternative uh, interpretations in to the inner circle, it actually forces agencies and departments to, to play more and more into bureaucratic politics to try to break through. That looks bad. And also that complicates re response if you're trying to do policy. Uh, and also, you know, if you've ever heard of groupthink, I mean, you know, the, you know this, is a, this is an administration, an inner circle, that because of the high in, in, you know, emphasis on loyalty, they're so insular, they don't let in information from outside, they, they want to, you know, there's this, this tight, cohesive emphasis. Talk about, a, I mean, talk about teed up good for groupthink dynamics or, or group malfunctions uh, in just a decision-making uh, setting. Uh, certainly the, the Trump people are, are, are setting that up. High distrust of others and low in-group bias. Uh, again, three standard deviations uh, above the scores for world and U.S. leaders. Um, what's the consequence of that? Well, you would expect Trump to exhibit extreme wariness, <coughs> suspicion, distrust of other countries, foreign leaders, domestic opposition groups. Uh, it's going to make compromise and building relationships of trust with others exceedingly difficult with Trump uh, because he prefers to maintain control and not and, and not engaging. Uh, a need for secrecy would be involved in this. What's interesting here is also the low in-group, uh, which is sort of a low national score, which might sound weird to you, but it's sort of a low in-group score. Uh, and what that means is that he, he uses nationalism for his own ends, not because he's, he's that into it. Uh, he's not really attached to any in-group, supposedly, that he's in. He's not really attached to the Republicans. He's more focused on Trump. And this is an observation that's long been noted by other Republicans about Trump. Frustrated that they didn't really feel like he was a true conservative or a true Republican. Uh, well, that score definitely kind of plays out on that score. Uh, so when you combine that high distrust, that low in-group, you're, you're looking at somebody who's going to be very wary, very extremely vigilant to opponents, uh, et cetera. Low self-confidence. Well, you know, certainly compa moderate compared to world leaders, but low compared to U.S. leaders. Uh, what you tend to see with low self-confidence leaders is that they tend to be defensive uh, with regard to their image, uh, and they're going to be prickly, highly defensive if they're denigrated or attacked or demeaned. I reference Saturday Night Live, uh, <laughs> which Trump cannot not watch. Um, and, uh, and Trump also has a, a low task orientation. People, people tend to vary, you know, if you look, you know, psychology has shown that people either tend to focus on affiliation or, or relationships with others or with task accomplishment, achievement, okay? Now, Trump is much more high on affiliation Adoration. and lower on task accomplishment. He really has a high need for affiliation and approval. That's why loyalty is also important. But he really, that's why, I mean, he wants adoration and acclaim uh, more than he wants accomplishing a specific task even. 
which is why he gets so defensive about poll numbers or numbers that turned up at his inauguration or anything like that. So overall, here's what we have. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, in my, my style, I call him a magistrate maverick. Uh, it's kind of the most dangerous combination of characteristics in terms of setting you up for problems. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, you, you, you get that high control, zero expertise, low complexity, coupled with an inexperienced, mostly pseudo-expert advisory inner circle. Uh, you know, that's problematic. And this is different from any of the other previous presidents that have had that sort of... Sir? Scale. Yeah. You haven't met, mentioned Richard Nixon in any of these comparisons. Uh, Nixon. Well, no. I mean, Nixon. Nixon sort of a different thing, and I, you know, I, I didn't want to get too far in the weeds with him. We can talk about Nixon if you okay. want, but uh, I, I assume there'll be some questions about narcissism at some point. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, but what we would expect with the style, you know, intense bureau political conflict, that that closed in, uh, information system, uh, constraint challenger. And the, and, the, and the scary thing for this is when we talk about crises, and you know, even if you don't go out trying to make crises, which it seems that the administration is kind of wanting to do, crises happen anyway when you're president. Bad stuff happens. Now, what we have found when we look at world leaders and you, and you look at scores like this, what happens when leaders are under stress and making decision making is we tend to see that their behavior all the traits that they are high in or that they trend towards are exacerbated when they're under high stress. <coughs> so what that means for Trump is that he will be in a heavy crisis more controlling, more distrustful, less complex. Uh, you know, those are not necessarily the qualities that I would be that thrilled about. Uh, here we've got some of the, uh, the advisors that are around Trump, although we can cross off Mr. Flynn down there in the bottom uh, as of today. Um, and, and again, these are, the sort, these, these are the sorts of advisors that you see around uh, Trump. And, and really, when you, think, when you talk about are there any experts, subject matter experts, well, I mean, I think Mattis is one of the few. I mean, you know, it's one of the few uh, examples of an appointment which didn't completely give everybody in the agency or department heartburn when they heard that's who was being appointed. Uh, and, uh, I mean, Flynn, Flynn uh, you know, I mean, him being gone, I think, is going to be uh, reacted to in Washington with a great sense of relief because uh, Flynn was basically fired from being director of the Defense Intelligence Agency for incompetent management. Uh, and, of course, that made him a perfect fit for the Trump administration. <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, but, but, you know, he was not going to be an even. If you're a national, the National Security Council is supposed to be, the, the advisor is supposed to be not an advocate. I mean, the ideal national security advisor is supposed to be, you know, the whole point of having the National Security Council is to try to coordinate all this information from all across government and say, okay, here are the various options, Mr. President, and make sure everything is vetted, make sure everything is laid out so the president can make good decisions. Flynn was always an advocate. He was never going to be an impartial arbiter. You look for a good past national security advisor, you know, Andrew Goodpaster under Eisenhower, Brent Scowcroft under George Herb Walker Bush were exemplary NSC advisors. Uh, you know, so, you know, him being gone, you know, maybe, maybe you have a, a the, the, the scuttlebutt is the Vice Admiral Harward, uh, who actually worked for General Mattis at CENTCOM. Uh, might be the one who is the lead to get the NSC advisor. And I think that, you know, if there is any silver lining today, I think that might be it. I find it deeply ironic that one of the other people Trump is considering is Petraeus. Uh, given all the grief he gave Hillary about a private email server and given Petraeus <laughs> gave classified information to yeah. his mistress, uh, you know, but we'll, we'll see who ends up getting, getting the appointment. Now, the last thing I want to talk about real quick before we just hit a few policy areas and then open up for questions is, you know, a couple of other aspects to consider. You can look here at the pictures of a, you know, the, you know, other than the psych profile, just age. Trump's going to be the oldest, old, is the oldest president. He's older than Reagan when he first took office. And so, you know, you can see that, you know, how the presidency ages. I mean, Trump would look like the crypt keeper, uh, you know, by the time he got done. But, you know, Trump never releases medical records, nor his tax records, but never his medical records either. So, but what we do know, he's 70 years old, overweight, doesn't exercise, and he's in a high-stress job. Uh, so the normal pattern that you would see for individuals like that uh, is that, you know, even if, you know, even, even if they were trying to take better, you know, there is some cognitive decline. 
Uh, there's decreased stamina, difficulty concentrating, etc. So you would expect that. Um, but again, we don't know for sure. But the only medical record we ever got, uh, well, it was leaked, that he, ha he takes a hair growth drug uh, that causes mood disorders and significant sexual dysfunction. Uh, so, and that's the whole medical report we have on Trump. Uh, so it doesn't really help us that much. Um, so, but older leaders often are seen to have a pattern of more risk taking because sometimes it, I, I think the hypothesis is that they have a shorter time window in which to try to accomplish things. Uh, so we'll see. But in any case, you know, with a high stress job like that, you can imagine that you know if Trump is already sort of having any sort of health problems, you could imagine the presidency would exacerbate that quite a bit. Now let's just throw out a couple of the foreign policy uh, areas real quick, and then we can we'll have 20 minutes of questioning. How about that? Uh, you know, a couple of the big areas of uh, foreign policy, I mean, pretty much every bit of foreign policy is going to be a challenge at this point, but um, some of the big ones, China uh, is one. Uh, certainly pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal uh, has set up quite a, a, a set of problems in Asia with our allies uh, because basically it ceded economic control of Asia to China. Uh, and a lot of our allies like South Korea and Japan and others were expecting the U.S. to be in there as a counterweight to China and instead we've abdicated that. So basically they're going to have to cut their own deals with China and maybe not have us at all. Um, so that's, that's not necessarily a good move. Um, it certainly has led to criticism from Japanese Prime Minister Abe and others. The South China Sea Islands uh, is a potential flashpoint. Uh, you had a lot of tough talk, Secretary of State Tillerson, basically saying that we would deny China access to its artificial islands, this building, uh, out in there with air, you know, when they've got airfields and missiles and all sorts. So, you know, if you're going to deny access to those, that means you're going to have to use the military to do it, and you're going to have to fight China. Um, Flynn, you know, gave tough talk. Trump has made similar statements. Now, you know, given that Trump already caved on the one China policy, when pressed. We don't know whether how much of this is just hot air and bluster. But, you know, if this, I mean, you know, the, the, at best, what Trump's doing is creating his own, you know, he gave Obama grief about the red line in Syria. He's creating a red line in the South China Sea for China. And then, you know, either you're going to set up a dangerous confrontation or you're going to embarrass yourself by not enforcing your own red line. So here we are. Uh, so, you know, that's China. Russia. <laughs> uh, U.S. policy is pretty incoherent on Russia at this point. Uh, there was blatant Russian interference in the U.S. election. I think mean, that's very clear. The intelligence community uh, came out, uh, basically unified in support of that position. So did FBI. Director Clapper uh, basically testified to this effect. Uh, how deep that went, we still do not know. Um, and uh, you know, but what we do see is. Uh, Trump has protected Putin, supported Putin, defended Putin publicly, attacked the intelligence community for bringing up this information. Uh, he also got the Republican uh, platform to remove the uh, uh, section condemning Russia for its aggression in Ukraine, in Crimea. Uh, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, the president basically in his call apparently didn't know what the START treaty was, but then basically once he was told, he got back on the phone with Putin and said, oh, well, I don't want to do this, it's unfair to the U.S. Well, so uh, I think that surprised the Russians, so perhaps they should have been, you know, have careful what they wished for. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, working with the Russians in Syria, I mean, essentially you end up, in many respects, what Putin's doing is almost setting up to do a reversal of policy because you're basically supporting Assad at that point. Um, they're not saying that, but the practical implication of it is that. Um, so you've got that, you've got the whole issue of moving the U.S. Embassy from <laughs> Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is going to have tremendous blowback through the Middle East. There's just a whole bunch of these moves that were just pushed through immediately or, or talked about immediately, clearly without any staffing, because anybody in the State Department that does Middle East, that region would be saying, ooh, 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 ooh. you know, there's a lot of bad blowback that you're likely to get from that. If it, I see the Russia thing as potentially being a major scandal in this administration. I think the Flynn resignation and some of the ideas, it, it's, and, and also just Trump's behavior makes it very difficult, his refusal to condemn Flynn earlier on, 
you know, this is going to make it increasingly difficult for Congress to not do some investigations and not just the pretend investigations that they're probably going to do up to this point. Um, Iran. Iran has been put on notice by our past National Security Advisor. Uh, Trump wants to get out of the Iran nuclear deal but has no uh, plan for what to do other than that because you know, none of the allies would go along with that. None of them would reinstitute their own sanctions. Uh, you know, if you don't accept the Iran nuclear deal, which Iran is, is honoring at this point, uh, the only alternative is to use military force. So, so we've got you know, military force as an option in China and Iran. Uh, Mexico, immigration, relations with allies. You know, we had the phone calls with President Nieto in Mexico, uh, Prime Minister Turnbull. Uh, you know, both of those were embarrassing the administration, but what the American press ignored was that those caused real domestic political problems for both of those leaders, too. Uh, both of those were, you know, oh, well, you're weak, and this is why Trump's treating you this way. I mean, it caused problems in those countries, uh, in Australia and Mexico. Um, you know, we got the wall, we got the Muslim ban, the blowback. Uh, you know, think about Iraq, and here we are, U.S. troops in Iraq, training Iraqi forces, preparing, you know, working on, on the Mosul operation, and we basically give uh, Muqtada al-Sadr, who we should not be helping at all, ammunition. Uh, you know, basically saying, oh, Iraqis, you're not allowed to, to come. We're banning you as part of the Muslim ban. It was just not thought out. Um, North Korea, there again, I mean, you know, Trump saying, oh, we will not allow you to have a, a missile test. Uh, well, they're going to have missile tests. Uh, so what do you do? Are you just going to, you know, resort to force? What are you going to do? I mean, so there's a lot of uh, potential areas where the administration could really run into some problems, and it doesn't appear that there has been a whole lot of thought behind what you do. I mean, as I tell a lot of my students, some of whom are here in the room, I say, you know, it's always, it's always easy to knock that first domino. But you got to pay attention to what the second, third, fourth, fifth domino falls. You know, it's, it's always easy to knock that first one over. Uh, okay, let's open it up to questions. Um, Want to make sure I gave put people plenty of time. Yeah. Just briefly, the other president you uh, did mention. Who else is complex? Uh, you didn't High you complexity presidents. A good examples of those would be Dwight Eisenhower, uh, John Kennedy, um, Billy Car or Jimmy Carter. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was high complexity. Obama was high complexity. Uh, you know, they kind of have that same, you see that pattern of, they tend to need a lot of, Bill Clinton, high complexity, they tend to need a lot of information. They tend to, you know, they, you know, they, they don't make decisions as fast. They, you know, you see, it's sort of the opposite of Trump in many respects. Low complexity, you know, Richard Nixon was high complexity. Uh, you know, the um, low complexity presidents, you know, Truman, Johnson, Reagan, W. Bush, Trump. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You said uh, that those were were had the same profile as Trump, uh, Truman. Some characteristics right. that were similar. Okay, similar. but you say they're different. How are they? Well, different? you know, the the difference you see. I mean, I think the big difference you see between, say, a Truman or a Johnson, and I, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on both of those. Is that both of those uh, did not have sort of the, the, the sort of distrust notions and all of those other aspects. They both wanted, they both had high needs for control. They both wanted it on the final decisions. Truman, famously so. Mm -hmm. They were both low complexity. But the thing is, they were surrounded by competent advisors, or for the most part. I mean, Truman, Truman had George Marshall, who I'm a great admirer. Of. I mean, you know, Atchison. Uh, all these, I mean, you know, you don't have a George Marshall or an Atchison in this in this group. Uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, even if you didn't like some of those, you know, George Bundy and and and, and uh, you know some of the others were, were you know, McNamara. They they weren't in, they weren't no government experience per se. Um, w. Bush was low complexity. You may not like Dick Cheney or Rumsfeld, but the one thing you could not say about Dick Cheney or Rumsfeld is that they didn't have any policy background or no government experience. And I think that's the biggest difference is that, you know, I think the da most dangerous part of this pattern is the lack of the 
grown-ups around them, you know, you know, the people with the expertise. So, other, yep. It seems like Trump has given General Mattis a lot more public deference than his other advisors. So how does, like, a figure like that play into this profile? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Mattis is one of the few that you hope. I mean, you would hope that he would he would somehow break into that inner circle. Because the thing is, you can be expert and you can be a really good advisor, but who has the president's ear? It isn't based upon what your job title is. It's based upon whether you have a relationship with the president. So, you know, if Bannon and Miller and Kushner, you know, his son-in-law, are the ones that have dinner with him and they're the ones that hang out with him all the time, they're probably going to be more influential than Mattis with him on some of his views. Now, that being said, I think that I think that Mattis, I mean, Trump is more deferential to Mattis to some extent, although Mattis has already had to threaten to resign once in the first three weeks because Trump appointed a Wall Street person as Secretary of the Army. And, and you know, and, and he had to withdraw because he felt he couldn't make it through the confirmation process, which makes me wonder what in the, what in the world could that have been, given what gets through as it is. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, but, uh, but, but, I mean, Mattis basically, the scuttlebutt is Mattis basically told Trump, if you try to appoint somebody like that again as Secretary of the Army, I'll resign. Mm. You know, I'm the one that should appoint that. And, you know, and I think one hopeful sign would be if Harwood is the one that gets picked, there'll probably have been some push from by Mattis to get him in an NSC slot. And you might have a little bit better coordination uh, if that were to happen. So I'm actually rooting for Mattis in that regard. Uh, but I, I think the jury is still out upon how, in, how influential he'll be with Trump. Um, because it was always me when I, I interviewed a lot of people who worked for the Bush W. Bush administration on the last book, uh, and one of the things you know you had you had Colin Powell who was very experienced. But I mean, you know, they used to organize meetings on Iraq when Powell was out of town. Uh, I mean, Dick Armitage was telling me he was saying, well, you know, they knew we were going to be out of town, so that's when they scheduled the meeting because they knew we would disagree. Um, so and Powell was cut out. So you can be experienced, but still not necessarily you know, be able to influence policy. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the general uh, lack of respect that then much of the world seems to be treating Trump with? Many countries openly like mocking him, releasing these like ads and stuff. And like how do you think it will enforce relationships with One, I think it hurts. I, mean, I think it hurts, you know, the US image. I think it hurts I mean when you're trying to build, I mean, aside from just the image of you know, Trump and whatever, I think that the problem is if you're trying to do policy and you're trying to engage with allies or you're trying to deal with opponents, if you are not seen as credible, if people question what you say, if people question your word, if people, you know, how, how hard is it going to be able to get allies to agree to do tough, tough lifting? So I think... You know, I, I, the, my concern is that sort of thing sows the seeds of making it difficult if we do have a crisis or we do have a problem where we really need to build working groups of other allies and others. <coughs> it's going to make it hard to do that, certainly for President Trump. I feel like a lot of leaders are going to have trouble t convincing their publics that, yes, oh, well, we should get into bed with Trump you know, on this issue. So, yeah. This is absolutely fascinating. Um, you, you say this adds up um, to one of the things this adds up to is a low learning. Yeah, because yeah, they're just not gathering but information. Can, maybe di different characteristics win campaigns versus run countries. Because on the <laughs> campaign trail, mm -hmm. I was horrified at how quickly he learned. And he outsmarted a lot of very smart people to win this election. And there, there, was, there was something in his gut that was, that was leading him in a direction that a lot of people said will never work. And he fooled us all. He, uh, well, I think my colleague Peg and we'll, we, we will sit and, and, and discuss Trump sometimes. And I think her, 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 her analogy was good. And she sees him as a rather effective used car salesman. <coughs> who's good at, you know, kind of persuading on something and marketing something, but not necessarily. But that's a skill, right? And it's a sure. skill to get you Well, you know, it's not, you know, I mean, obviously Trump has a skill set, but, the, you know, this. Uh, it's it's long been remarked. Tom Cronin, uh, you know, wrote a book on the presidency. Uh, one, you know, said that the, the skills that it takes to, you know, win the presidency are not necessarily the skills right. it takes to govern. 
I mean, actually, low complexity presidents have a little bit of an advantage during elections just because they think in simple terms. Everything is black and white. So, you know, you don't have to, it's try to, trying to get the, uh, uh, an electorate that's relatively uninformed to understand all of them. Here's all this nuance. Here's all these dimensions. Whereas, you know, oh, well, I'll just make America great again. You know, it's much better for bumper stickers and slogans. So it's, it's more fun. You think about the, uh, you know, if I have any communications people here, I mean, you know, the average sound bite, you know, 25 years ago on the evening news for a candidate talking is 45, 54 seconds, something like that. The sound bite in the last election is 4.5 seconds. Now, you try to explain nuance in that. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think presidents do, I mean, candidates that are less complex do have a bit of an advantage. In the, you know, in, but that advantage is not an advantage when it comes to actually governing. Right. And, and, you know, the thing is, I mean, Trump's very good at presenting things, but he, it's questionable whether he really had the business record he claimed to have. Right? I mean, you know, for such a good businessman, bankrupting four times, uh, at least. And all, who knows what else with the tax records being hidden. That's the concern. I think that if you look for where the smoking gun for the, the Russia scandal could, could come out, that hesitation to release the tax records. I mean, Trump has been doing business in Russia for 15 years, trying to. Very difficult to do business in Russia because it's such a corrupt business environment. Okay, so you know, uh, it, you know, if you haven't got any problems, then you should probably release the tax records. Right. Uh, that would clarify a lot of the, the concerns a lot of people have. That wouldn't be do with political ban. Well, if there's something there. You know, I mean, you know, and who knows? I mean, you know, I mean, the whole, I mean, the intelligence community and others are corroborating little more and more bits and pieces of that, uh, the uh, the dossier uh, that was released earlier, uh, and certainly the Russians were collecting economically compromising information on it, and we won't get into the other stuff. Um, so, uh, but you know, I mean, this is this is what I see as something that could really just take the knees out from the Trump administration. If that, if there is actually some fire behind all this. So, yeah. Just, um, with the uh, unified government, um, due to this profile, do you see uh, Trump and his administration's ability to uh, use that to push their agenda uh, compromise by these traits at all? Uh, less likely to be able to use the relationship, the majority effectively with Ryan and well, I mean, you know, I think, uh, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really care about those constraints. And, uh, you know, so far, it doesn't look like congressional Republicans have put up much of a block line. Uh, they've tended to be just, well, I'll, I think we'll get some of our goodies passed, so we'll hold our nose. Uh, but, you know, I think it would become increasingly problematic, and you see people like Lindsey Graham and, and, and McCain and others, even today, you know, pushing for investigations. On the Russia, and, and and Flynn is like that crack in the in the dam, you know, where okay, some water's coming out of that now. When were you talking to the Russians? What did you say? You know, and this tell this tells you how you know why Flynn might have been fired for incompetence at DIA. Here you have a former director of DIA didn't understand his recordings or being his phone calls were being taped when he was talking to the Russians. Uh, so there you are, uh, but yeah, in the back. So are there any conditions under which you know, that sort of personality traits will be seen positively? <laughs> <laughs> so what, well, in the spirit of Valentine's Day, <laughs> you, you want to? Uh, well, the question. What was he, he wanted to know, is there anything in the personality traits that could be seen in a positive light? Um, well, you know, I, without, I, I, won't, I won't be smart about it and say, well, you know, it could be refreshing to have somebody with new experience. Uh, the, you know, the thing is, if you have, I mean, certain types of crises, I would say that, um, you know, are well suited to somebody who's very black and white. I mean, you know, Bush, I mean, the more nuanced and complex a crisis situation is, the more difficult a low complexity leader finds it to deal with it because they don't think in nuance, they don't think in, in shades of gray. Bush was generally given high marks for the immediate reaction to 9-11. You know, well, it wasn't that complicated. You, you knew, well, we're not in favor of it, right? And we know we should go after it. You know, we figure it's bin Laden. So, you know, I mean, that was straight down, fastball right down the middle of the plate for somebody like Bush. 
The problem for Bush is he didn't stop there. And once you got into something like Iraq, then it was all shades of gray and nuance, and that is not that is not a friend to a leader like that. So with somebody like Trump, if he has a crisis like that, he could, in fact, maybe handle it okay, you know, because he would have a quicker, you know, reaction to it. And how long does it take to tweet? Uh, but, you know, again, you know, they'll make fast decisions, but it's almost like Truman and others. You, they make a fast decision, but sometimes you've got to hope that they're shooting straight. Or that, they, you know, if they, if they misjudge the situation, that fast reaction can also get you into a lot of trouble. So, so there's, you know, sort of a positive there. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Syria, and I just want to know if you believe it's inevitable that uh, Trump becomes a uh, proponent of the Assad government, especially if they've got him on like a three-year withdrawal plan. Is that what I, if I read correctly, the Russians want well, to do that? But after seeing like Libya, um, what else, uh, Iraq, and Afghanistan, mm-hmm. kind of lack of leadership after we've removed governments there. You know, it's, well... Uh, you know, let me caveat it by saying that the, the Trump isn't exactly consistent with policy pronouncements. Yeah, so, like, yeah. one day it's with this, one day it's that. Um, there, I mean, there's been a lot of. I mean, the concerns that I have is that, you know, by by basically, I mean, he seems to want to work with the Russians enormously. Well, the Russians are working with the Iranians and Assad. So, if your primary focus is ISIS, well, fine, but that means that you're not focusing on getting rid of Assad. Once ISIS is gone, is is Trump really going to be in a position to then go after Assad with the Russians? And the US? So I mean, you know, I think it almost ends up being a fait accompli. The concern that I have is Trump talking about, you know, because the Turks don't like the Kurds, and the Kurds are the most effective group mm-hmm. fighting ISIS at the moment in Syria. My concern would be that you know Trump would undercut support for the Kurds because you know just because the, the Turks don't like them, mm-hmm. and, and et cetera, and I. You know, sure, not the obvious one. Right, it, but but you know, I, I think it would be kind of productive. You know, because then if you don't support the Kurds, well, then you don't even have any options really by the time this is all over. Kind of vis-a-vis Assad. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, where did Nixon fall on the spectrum of Russia versus Russia? Like, did he have any issues with Russia? Now I don't have. I I I've got a couple stories, but I don't I don't I don't recall the, the exact score for Nixon. So I hate to guess. So he was even three standard deviations above the average, which was significant. I mean, what are well, what I'm talking about is there, we have a data set of 600 world leaders, including U.S. leaders. Uh, so in that set, yes, uh, Nixon was very distrustful, and I mean, I'm sure he probably did have a healthy distrust score. Um, and you'll notice I did not go into any of this. You know, there's a lot of you know discussions about Trump and narcissism and all that. I didn't go into any of that here. That's that's outside of what I'm. You know, the profile that we were in. So, so yeah, I mean, my suspicion is you're correct. Um, it makes me suspicious. Could you go into personality traits of Putin in regard to Trump? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Putin is, is, is high control, high complexity. Uh, Putin is very strategic. He'll, he'll eat Trump's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think what you consistently see, I mean, what you consistently see, or American policymakers, and this is true with Obama's administration too, consistently underestimate Putin. Yeah. You know, they, they use a little stereotype in their head of, you know, oh, well, this is just a former KGB person. Yeah, okay, and you keep thinking that way, and Putin's still going to be, you know, you know, winning out on you. So we have time for one last question. Okay, one last question, yeah. Um, are you <laughs> surprised in any way by the... American publics are, I mean, it's not being high rental, but definitely like Trump's base is total like disregard or like not really caring about his ties with Russia, especially with like how like anti Russia we have been for the history of the US usually. I think I'm just more generally concerned by um, the proportion of the electorate that, that you know, whether it be the lack of a quality media, how much, how much. Uh, Media has kind of abdicated its uh, fact-finding mm-hmm. roles. How much, you know, maybe, uh, you know, there's there's lots of problems here. But I just, I think I'm I'm concerned by just the electorate that would accept that. I think some of the discrediting of the press that has been sort of pushed by more conservative angles for years. You know, the well, it's a liberal bias. All this. Now you're getting to the point where any news which isn't supported is fake news and all this. And I think for people, pe- people want to believe the things that that fit their beliefs. I mean. 
Uh, beliefs are like possessions. You don't like to give them up very easily. Right? So, you know, I think this environment with social media is so easy to you know, do. There's a reason why 1984 is back up on the bestseller list. Because yeah. <laughs> propaganda is very relevant. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess it's sort of Will Rogers kind of frames it up best. So Will Rogers had this great quote. He says, you know, it isn't what people know that worries me. It's what they know for sure that ain't so. <laughs> and I think that's the problem. So I'm afraid our time is up. This has been a very interesting, if not a bit depressing, conversation. Happy Valentine's Day!